The next area is in reserves. And these two items, the asset valuation reserve and the interest maintenance reserve are both very specific to life insurance companies. No other insurance company has these two items. So I wanted to give a brief background as some context to help understand what they are first before we talk about the treatment. So the first item is the asset valuation reserve. So this is a liability that's required to be established. And the intent is, as you can see here, is to offset potential credit related investment losses. So think, you know, if you if the if somebody's issued a bond and that company were to go bankrupt or to go under, this reserve is meant to help offset that potential loss. On the flip side, you have the interest maintenance reserve. So this is meant to help offset movement in the market and interest rates in general. And so what it does is it defers the recognition of any realized gain or loss takes it out of the income statement in that given year and will and it's amortized over time. The real intent with this interest maintenance reserve, which we'll refer to as IMR, is to discourage insurance companies from buying and selling their investments um, just to make money based on you know, the current market. They want them to hold on to those because they have these long-term liabilities that they want to make sure are funded. So with that background, we'll first go to the asset valuation reserve. So like I mentioned, this is strictly a statutory and for life insurance. So you'll note for GAP, this doesn't exist. So it comes off the books. But when it is initially recorded, it's based on the varying assets that a company holds. And there's a specific charge for each type of asset. And that calculation is what gets you to your reserve. So when it's recorded, the liability is booked and the offset is directly to surplus. So for GAP, when you're unwinding that liability, the offset will also be right back to surplus. Now the interest maintenance reserve, because it's dealing with realized gains and losses that are in the income statement, it's not necessarily gonna have an impact on surplus. So like for statutory, when you're booking this, like I mentioned, you'll back out the income statement activity for the year, and those gains and losses are transferred into this reserve. And then like there's a schedule that will show how they're to be amortized over the life or over a certain amount of time. For gap purposes, again, it's just the reversing of the entry. So those realized gains and losses will be back in the income statement. The next item is reinsurance. Now for most reinsurance contracts, the accounting will generally be the same between statutory and GAAP. The main difference comes in the presentation. So for statutory accounting, you're allowed to net the reinsurance activity. So the example we've given here is often um, when a reinsurance agreement is entered into, if the company is seeding a block of business, they'll take a reserve credit to reduce their reserves since they're no longer liable for those policies. And so they'll net that and show a net reserve number on the financial statements. For gap purposes, everything has to be grossed up. And so you wouldn't take a reserve credit. And if there were any recoverables or payables, those would all have to be presented at their gross amount. So it has the potential to make the balance sheet look a little bit inflated, but that is how it's required to be presented for gap. Moving on to leases, this is, there's a pretty significant difference here. I think statutory accounting maybe makes it a little bit simpler than we see for GAAP. For statutory accounting, all leases are considered operating. So any lease expense runs through the income statement and that's the end of the guidance. Uh, for GAAP, leases are considered to either be operating or financing and those st standards are changing um, in the next couple of years for GAAP. So be aware that that has the potential to be a pretty significant adjustment and or difference if you're looking at the financial statements. A couple of other items just to note, they're not necessarily super common and they can be pretty specific to each entity. So we didn't dive in too deep, but the first is derivatives. So if your corporation holds derivatives, be aware that fundamentally there's usually not a difference in how the, whether determining whether it's 
an effective hedge or not an effective hedge, that calculation and consideration is usually the same between stat and gap, but there are some significant differences in how they're presented in the financials and some of the disaggregation. So if you do hold those, be aware that you're gonna to want to go look at that guidance specifically. The other area is in reserves. So often an actuary is the one who's determining the reserve amount. And so just be aware that if you are planning on presenting both statutory financial statements as well as a gap basis, make sure your actuary knows as there are some adjustments to the assumptions that they need to make, as well as some adjustments to their calculations based on some of the gap items. So they'll likely want to have a separate opinion that they issue over the gap. So make sure they're aware of that. So those are the items we had to cover today. If you have any specific questions on something we covered or if something wasn't clear, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help delve into specific questions, but we hope this gave you a brief overview of just some of the differences to be aware of um, and that do exist between statutory accounting and gap accounting for life insurance companies. Thank you.